Welcome to the World History One Lecture Series. At the end of each slide, there will be a 10-second delay. Use this time to pause the presentation and complete your notes. When you are done, push play and you will move forward. This lecture will begin in 5 seconds. Welcome to World History One, Lecture 9.8 on Italian Renaissance Art and Literature, and it's time to take a road trip to this museum in Boston, Massachusetts. It's called the Gardner Museum, and it's really cool for two reasons. Number one, it's near Fenway Park, but number two, it sits in a house that was once owned by this woman, Isabella Gardner. Here's the deal. Gardner married a really rich guy, and they had a baby, but that baby died. To get over the death of her child, Gardner went on a road trip to Europe, and she visited places like Paris and Venice. While she was there, she bought a lot of really cool stuff, which she brought back to Boston and decorated her house with. When Gardner died, she left her house and everything inside it to the people who now run this museum. The cool part is this. Gardner bought some important Renaissance art, like this painting, which is called Virgin and Child with an Angel. It's from the early 1470s, and it was painted by Sandro Botticelli. Botticelli was a master of a technique called perspective. Look at that picture. Once you get past the people, how far out of that window can you look? You can look all the way into that valley, and because of this, there are no words to describe the awesomeness of this painting. This is typical of Renaissance art, and today we're going to look at the most important pieces of Renaissance art and literature, because these pieces of art and literature form the foundation of modern Western art and literature. With that said, let's go to the next slide. The cool thing about the Renaissance isn't that there's a rebirth in classical culture. Instead, this rebirth allows people to look at the world around them from a different perspective. The best way to see this is by comparing medieval art to Renaissance art. Medieval art, you have a focus on Christian themes as art led to the salvation for the artists. Artists are painting religious themes so they can get into heaven. With Renaissance art, religious themes are incorporated into a focus on individuals. We focus on the individual, not the religion. Medieval art, we have flat perspective and disproportionate size. Things don't look quite right. In Renaissance art, we have a use of 3D perspective and vivid colors. We're trying to make it look as real as possible. Medieval art is also Gothic art, which lays the foundation for humanism. We find this in Renaissance art. Humanism focuses on secular and worldly manners in realism. In other words, we're not focusing on the religious, we're focusing on the human. Finally, there are many famous artists in medieval art. They include Donatello, Giotto, Battista, Alberti, Simon Blu, Brunischelli, Fra Langenico, and Lorenzo Ghiberti. Renaissance art, you only need to know two. The famous artists include Da Vinci and Michelangelo. Go to the next slide. The best way to compare art from different eras is to find two paintings focusing on the exact same topic. So what we'll do is we're going to look at the Crucifixion of Jesus by Giotto for our medieval art, and we're going to look at Pieta from Michelangelo for our Renaissance art. They both capture the same moment, the death of Jesus Christ. Looking at the medieval art, you will see first that we have religious themes. Jesus is on the cross and there are angels surrounding him. Second, we see that Jesus is not in proportion. His arms are too long, his legs are too long, his torso is too long. He is not in the proportion of a normal human figure. And finally, you will notice that everything looks like it is in flat perspective. Nobody has 3D looks in this picture. Now let's look at Pietra. Same event, 
different perspective. First thing, religious themes are incorporated. That is Jesus Christ there. Those are angels holding out his arms. But the focus is not Jesus on the cross. The focus is Jesus dying. Second thing you will see are human qualities. Everybody there from Jesus to the Virgin Mary to the two angels look human. And finally, we have that 3D perspective. Everybody in Michelangelo's picture looks human and in three dimensions. Go to the next slide. Now that you see how people are looking at things differently in the Renaissance, let's look at some accomplishments in art. Leonardo da Vinci, who's around from 1452 to 1519 CE, painted the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Michelangelo, who's around from 1475 to 1564 CE, sculpted the statue of David and painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. We also have new techniques in art. Frescoes are made using a complex layered technique with plaster and multiple paints. You're essentially painting the artwork into the wall itself. And finally, sculptures are made to look realistic like David and the Fountain of Neptune in Florence. Does that look familiar? It should because our Neptune statue is made in a classical or Renaissance style. Go to the next slide. Renaissance writers are also looking at things differently, so let's talk about comedy. No, not that type of comedy. Dante uses vernacular, which means he writes in Italian and not Latin, to write the Divine Comedy and the Inferno. Now ordinary Italians can read these books because they're written in their language. Niccolo Machiavelli, who's around from 1469 to 1527 CE, writes The Prince, which is a treatise or book on government written for, guess who, the de' Medici family of Florence. And it teaches rulers the following lessons. Absolute power is good, and this is how to acquire and maintain power. The end justifies the means. Do good when possible, and evil when necessary, and it's better to be loved than feared. Machiavelli had some other ideas as well. He who wishes to be obeyed must know how to command. Politics has no relation to morals. A prince never lacks a legitimate reason to break a promise, and it is double pleasure to deceive the deceiver. In other words, most modern rulers and politicians rely on the teachings of Machiavelli. Go to the next slide. Renaissance writers aren't just writing books, they're also writing sonnets. A sonnet is a 14-line lyrical poem written in an iambic pentameter or rhythm that employs several rhyme schemes and adheres to a tightly structured thematic organization. What does that mean? Well, why don't we just look at a famous example. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her into your heart. Then you can start to make it better. The Beatles, bam, Renaissance men. Now, before the Renaissance, we have somebody from the medieval era, Petrarch, who's around from 1307 to 1374, is a lyrical poet who is considered the father of humanism. Check this out. Petrarch's sonnets celebrate the individual person and stimulated the study of Greek and Roman literature and culture. In other words, this guy's sonnets got other people to think about rediscovering classical culture. Go to the next slide.
As you've seen, individuals in the Renaissance are looking at the world from a different viewpoint or perspective. We call this viewpoint humanism. Humanism is a collection of philosophies and beliefs that focus on the person both individually, as we see in this picture from da Vinci, and collectively. No longer are we looking at Jesus as a figure on the cross surrounded by angels. Now we're looking at Jesus in the human condition that of dying and in the human form. Here's the thing. Patrons, wealthy families in Italy are loving this. Humanism was supported by multiple patrons and it fostered the study of Latin, philosophy, rhetoric, composition, and literature. And it stimulated the study of Greek and Roman literature and culture. This picture is the School of Athens by Raphael. You see, we don't focus on the school, we focus on all the people inside it. That's it for this lecture, and I look forward to seeing you in class.